Hello everyone and welcome to Python programming. My name is Bara and I will be your instructor throughout this course. I hold a bachelor's degree in electrical and electronics engineering. Throughout my education and work, I gained proper knowledge in programming and embedded systems. I hope that I will be able to deliver an excellent content to all of you. During this course, we will learn what is artificial intelligence and explore its applications. The course will also cover Python programming from basic concepts to advanced techniques that aim at teaching you the needed skills to implement AI algorithms and design AI models. I hope that you will have a joyful learning experience. See you in the next video. To understand artificial intelligence or AI, let's take this example. Imagine that you are in a self-driving car and you want to go from work to home. You will ask the car verbally to take you home. The car will convert your speech to text, then analyze the text to understand your destination and start moving toward it. This process is called speech processing and it's a big part of AI. While the car is driving autonomously to your home, the front cameras detect motion and analyze it as a pedestrian moving toward the road. So, it decelerates the speed as a precautious procedure. This process is under computer vision and image processing, which AI contributes there as well. So, AI is code, program, software, and an algorithm, but a special type of these. It's a brain that we design and code to equip computers and even machines with. This brain allows those computers and machines to learn and then improve themselves over time to become much better at their assigned task, sometimes even reaching superhuman levels. In 1997, Deep Blue made history as the first computer to beat the world champion Kasparov in chess. Although Deep Blue did not have any AI implementation, but rather hard-coded algorithm, it opened a new era to improve AI in gaming. And in 2017, AlphaZero was developed by the AI research team DeepMind and became one of the most advanced AI chess master that no human can beat. We all have AI around us, like Amazon, Siri, Google Maps, and the list keep going. AI is very broad field. There are tens of categories that fall under it, such as machine learning, neural network, and much more. This course will teach you how to program and code in Python with the ultimate goal of use this programming skill to implement AI algorithms. Throughout this class, we will also learn more about AI and its applications and uncover how it helped how we use and utilize computers. So let's start. To give you an idea how artificial intelligence algorithms work, let's try this activity. Search on your browser for AutoDraw. This platform tries to predict your drawing. Now, try to draw something like a car, for example. While you are drawing, the platform will try to predict your drawing by showing similar images to your drawing on the top of the screen. So, the algorithm was trained over thousands of different drawings that were created by people. The algorithm tries to detect and find patterns in those drawings so later, if it sees similar drawings, it can recognize them. After knowing what AI is, you might ask yourself this question. Why do we need to learn programming? Why Python? And how is it related to AI? Programming is the process of creating a set of instructions that tell a computer how to perform a task. Programming can be done using a variety of computer programming languages, such as JavaScript, Python and C++. Python language has been growing rapidly over recent years and is now one of the most popular programming languages in the world. Python is quickly becoming the top choice for artificial intelligence projects. And that's because Python comes with a huge number of inbound sets of programming instructions which we call libraries, many of which are libraries for artificial intelligence. So, we practiced in this class one of the AI activities and we learned why we choose Python programming language to learn and practice AI. In the next video, we will learn how to download and install Python. Python is a multi-purpose programming language with a simple and beginner-friendly syntax. Downloading Python is easy. 
but downloading it with all related packages to artificial intelligence might be difficult, especially for beginners. That's why we have something called Anaconda, which is a free and open source distribution of Python, which means a bundle that contains an implementation of Python with the source code that anyone can inspect and modify. And this distribution is for scientific computing that aims to simplify artificial intelligence packages management and installation. Go to Anaconda website Then click on products and choose individual edition. Scroll down and click 64-bit graphical installer for Python 3.7. Make sure you choose the right operating system. After downloading is complete, run the exe file, then click next. Read the license agreement and click on I agree. Click on next. Note your installation location and then click Next. It's recommended that you do not check Add Anaconda to my path environment variable because this can interfere with other software. Click Install. Click Next. Again, Next. Click Finish. After finishing the installation, Click on the Start menu and choose Anaconda Navigator. Click OK and do not show again. Right now we are in the base environment, which is a directory that contains a specific collection of libraries and packages that have been pre-installed for us. We could also work on a different environment by clicking on Create and install the required libraries manually. Launch Jupyter Notebook. Jupyter is a web-based application in which you can create and share documents that contain live code, equations, and visualizations. We are going to use it to write and run Python codes. In the last video, we learned how to install Anaconda and how to run Jupyter Notebook from the Anaconda Navigator. Note that right now you are not actually running a notebook, but instead, you are just running the notebook server. To create a notebook, let's go to the desktop first and create a new folder with the name Jupyter Notebook. Go into the folder and create New Python 3 Notebook. Let's rename the Python Notebook to Lesson 1. If you go to your desktop, you will see the new folder that we created, and inside it, the Python file. The extension of the Python file is IPYNP, which indicates that it's a notebook document used by Jupyter Notebook. Now our setup is complete and we are ready to start Python programming. See you in the next class. Hello everyone and welcome back. In this class, we are going to learn how to create cells in Jupyter Notebook and how to write a simple Python code. In addition, we are going to talk about comments and markdown in Jupyter Notebook. But before that, we are going to try an AI activity and revise the definition of AI. Let's get started. Google AI Experiments is a showcase for simple experiments that make it easier for anyone to start exploring machine learning through pictures, drawings, language, music, and more. In this video, we are going to try Symantris activity. Search on your browser for Symantris. Symantris is a set of word association games powered by machine learning.
click on Play Arcade. A light blue word will appear on the top of the words list. Follow the tutorial by writing the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of that blue word. As you can see, the blue word was shifted to the bottom of the list, below the blue line. This indicates that your word is closely associated with the blue word. Try and keep writing words related to the blue word. The game was designed by training on billions of conversations from the internet. The AI has learned to predict which words, phrases, and even sentences might come next in the conversation. The technique that was used to make this game is called machine learning. We can define machine learning as a program or a system that over time learns from the data it receives. It improves itself to better perform the task it was assigned to do. These tasks can be predicting future events and values such as weather forecasting or learning how to differentiate between things like cats and dogs. What does that mean for us? Input data in this experiment is a billion pairs of statements where the second statement is a response to the first one. Predicting. The experiment is predicting the response to a question or a statement. After seeing all those pairs of sentences and responses, the AI learns to identify what a good response might look like. Model. The trained system that is used for making predictions. After training, the model is able to pick the most likely response from a pool of options. Try to play the other game, Blocks. It's very similar to Arcade and works in the same way but gives you different experience. After learning what is machine learning, let's go back to Python. See you in the next video. In the last class, we created a Python notebook and we named it Lesson 1. Open that notebook using Jupyter. We call this block a cell. A notebook cell is where you write your code. And a cell uses the kernel that you choose when you started your notebook. A kernel is nothing but a program that runs your code. In our case, you started Python 3 as your kernel, so that means you can write Python code in your code cells. Since your initial notebook has only one empty cell in it, that notebook can't really do anything. Thus, to verify that everything is working as it should, let's go ahead and add some Python code to the cell and try running its contents. Let's try adding the following code to that cell. Print hello Jupyter. Running a cell means that you will execute the cell's contents. To execute a cell, you can just select the cell and click the run button that is in the row of buttons along the top. If you prefer using your keyboard, you can just press shift plus enter. When I ran the code above, the output looked like this. When you run a cell, you will notice that there are some square braces next to the word into the left of the cell. The square braces will autofill with the number that indicates the order that you ran the cells. For example, if you open a fresh notebook and run the first cell at the top of the notebook, the square braces will fill with the number 1. The Jupyter Notebook has several menus that you can use to interact with your notebook. The menu runs along the top of the notebook just like menus do in other applications. Try discovering the objective of each option in the menu. One of the most important things to do when you are programming is adding comments. Comments are lines that exist in computer programs that are ignored when you run the program. Including comments in programs makes code more readable for humans as it provides some information or explanation about what each part of a program is doing. A comment in Python starts with the hash character, 
and extends to the end of the physical line. Let's try it. In the next video, we will learn what is Markdown and how to create it. In this class, we are going to learn what is Markdown and how can we create one. Markdown is a lightweight and popular markup language, which is a written standard language for data scientists and analysts. It helps in annotating a document in a way that is more convenient from plain text, meaning when the document is processed for display, the markup language is not shown and is only used to format the text. Markdown cell displays text which can be formatted using Markdown language. In order to enter a text which should not be treated as a code by the notebook server, it must be first converted to a Markdown cell, either from the cell menu or by using the keyboard shortcut M while in command mode. Go ahead and create a Markdown cell. We can do a lot with this new cell. The first thing we will create is a heading. Headings start with the hash symbol followed by a space. And there are six headings with the largest heading only using one hash symbol and the smallest heading using six hash symbols. We can also create block quotes. Block quotes can hold a large chunk of text. They can be obtained by using the markdown symbol greater than. Let's try them. You can create bold and italic text by using stars. Write a single star for italic. or two stars for ball. Or three stars for bold and italic, as you can see. You can add horizontal line if you want to separate two paragraphs by using three hyphens, just like this example. One of the powerful features of using Markdown is creating lists. You can create ordered lists by the required number followed by space with the example given below. Or we can use the same example to create an ordered list by changing the numbers to the hyphen symbol with space. We can also create any text and attach external links to it. Start with the text followed by the URL for the site in the markdown cell, where the double underscore is on both sides with the text link enclosed in a square bracket and the URL for the site is enclosed in parentheses. The last thing we are going to learn on Markdown is how to create tables and add images to them. The table contains the information in rows and columns and is built by the combination of vertical pipe to separate each column and hyphen symbol to create the header where the blank line. A combination of vertical pipe and dashes to render the table format. Instead of doing it manually, we will use this website to generate the table format for us. As you can see, it's easy and simple to use. Try to create your own table. 
Now let's add a suitable image to the table. You can insert an image from the toolbar by choosing the insert image from the edit menu and you can browse for the required image as shown below. In this class, we covered what is Markdown and how can we create our own Markdown cells in Jupyter Notebook. There are more stuff you can do with Markdown. Try searching them. See you in the next video. In this class, we learned what is machine learning and we tried the activity semantics. Moreover, we got introduced to Jupyter Notebook interface and learned what cells are. Then we started Python programming and learned how to use the print command. Also, we learned different techniques in adding comments in Python. And after that, we learned what is Markdown and how can we create different Markdown cells. At the end of each class, we are going to have our class project. The class project will summarize everything you learned during the class and will give you the opportunity to test and examine your knowledge. Our class project is as follows. Create a notebook document using Jupyter Notebook that gives you the same output as this. See you in the next class. Hello everyone and welcome back. In this class we are going to learn what are variables and understand their different types. In addition, we are going to talk about a numeric data type in specific and learn what are numeric operators. But before that, let's go back in time and see when the AI was invented and who was the first person to give it that name. Without computers, we would not have any AI today. The story started in 1882 when Charles Babbage designed the first mechanical computer. Considered by some to be father of the computer. The artwork and the sophistication of his creation was ahead of his time, so unfortunately his design wasn't built directly, but after his time. However, it opened a new era to develop computers, and in 1946, the world got introduced to the first digital computer, INIA, which stands for Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer which was developed by professors at the University of Pennsylvania. AI is not new, unlike what many people think. It goes back to 1956, when John McCarthy introduced the term for the first time, but it wasn't popular because the machines back there were basic and could not handle the proposed algorithms until the late 90s. AI got a new boom around 2010 till now mainly for these two reasons. First of all, we now live in the age of big data, an age in which we have the capacity to collect huge sums of information for a person to process. Today, a simple search on Google can find millions. Then, the discovery of the very high efficiency of computer processors, including graphics card processors, to accelerate the calculation of learning algorithms. The process being very iterative, 
It could take weeks before 2010 to process the entire data. The computing power of these new processors is capable of more than a thousand billion transactions per second with affordable prices. After learning the history of AI, let's go back to Python. See you in the next video. In this class, we are going to talk about variables. A variable in programming is a named location in primary memory. It's like a bag that can store value inside it. The value stored in a variable can usually be changed throughout the program execution. When we write a Python program, we will create many variables which store values. The values stored in a variable can be numbers, like integers or floats, or text-based like strings or other data types. Don't worry, we are going to talk about each one of them later. Let's see this example. Write the following code in a new notebook cell. my underscore name equal para. Then run the cell. Remember you can use the shortcut key control plus enter. We created a new variable and give it the name my underscore name and store the value bara inside it. Let's use the print command to show the stored value. As we mentioned, part of dealing with variables is giving them names. Python has some rules that you must follow when forming a variable. A variable name may only contain letters, uppercase or lowercase, numbers or the underscore character, but no spaces. May not start with the number. May not be a keyword. Keywords are reserved words in Python. If we break any of these rules, our program will exit with a syntax error. However, not all variables which are syntactically correct are meaningful to human readers. There are a few guidelines that we should follow when naming our variables to make our code easier to understand by other people and by us. This is an important part of following a good coding style. Be descriptive. A variable name should describe the contents of the variable. Do not use abbreviations unnecessarily. They may be ambiguous and more difficult to read. Pick a naming convention and stick to it. This is a commonly used naming convention in Python. Names of variables should be in lowercase with underscores. In some other languages like Java, the standard is to use camel case with the initial letter lowercase, but this style is less popular in Python. Let's create a variable that stores your height and print it. In the next video, we will learn the different types of numeric values in Python. See you in the next video. In this class, we are going to talk about numeric data and the numeric operators. As we discussed in the previous class, a variable can store different values inside it, and it can change throughout the program's execution. Numbers are essential data in any program that can be stored in variables. There are different data types of variables that can store numbers. We will start with integers. An integer or int type is a whole number, such as 1, 5, 1350, or minus 34. 1.5, on the other hand, is not an integer because it has a decimal point. Numbers with decimal points are floating point numbers, and they are from the data type float. Even 1.0 is a floating point number and not an integer. Floating point numbers are numbers with a decimal point or an exponent or both. 
Examples are 5.0, 10 0 0.0, 10.24, 0.0, 12. and 0.3. We can use scientific notation to denote very large or very small floating point numbers. For example, we can write the number 3.8 times 10 to the power 15 as 3.8 e15 or 3.8 e plus 15. Let's create two different variables. The first one to store your age and should be an integer. The second one to store your height in meters and should be float. To find the data type of variable in Python, you use the type function. A function is a block of code, which only runs when it's called. You can pass data, known as parameters, into a function. A function can return data as a result. We will talk later in depth on functions. To use the type function, place the variable inside the type function, and Python will return the data type. Try it on the variables we created previously. Let's delete the previous cell. To quickly delete a cell, select the cell, then click the keyboard letter D twice. There are many numeric operators we can apply for integers or float data. Starting with the basic addition by using the plus sign. Note that if you add two integers, the answer is integer, as you can see. And the same thing applied to float numbers. But when you add float to an integer, the answer will always be float as it's shown. We can do subtraction by using the minus sign. For multiplication, we can use the star sign. Note that the same rules apply for subtraction and multiplication in terms of the answer data type. We use the slash sign for division and the answer will always be float. One of the useful operators in Python and other programming languages is the modulus operator, which has the sign percentage. It divides left-hand operand by the right-hand operand and returns reminder as the answer of this operation. Let's try 5 modulus 2. As you can see, the reminder of 5 divided by 2 is 1. We can perform exponential or power calculations on operators by using two stars, just like this example. The last numeric operator we are going to learn is the floor division, which has the sign two slashes. This operator applies normal division, but the result is the floor, which means that the digits after the decimal points are removed. Try playing around with these numerical operators using the two different numeric data types we learned today. See you in the next video. In this class, we talked about the history of AI and what are the technologies that enable AI to become a reality in our time. Moreover, we learned about variables and the rules that we must follow when forming them in Python. Also, we covered how to follow a good coding style. 
Then we got introduced to the numeric data type integer and float and learned different numeric operators that we can apply for integers and float data. Create a notebook document using Jupyter Notebook that gives you the same output as this. data type and get introduced to its different functions and operators. But before that, we will try a fast and easy way to create machine learning models. As we discussed before, machine learning is a program or system that over time learns from the data it receives. It allows us to create smart programs that can make their own decisions based on what they learned. We can classify machine learning to three main categories Supervised, Unsupervised, and Reinforcement You will cover these categories in depth in the next course but for now we will talk about Supervised Learning Supervised basically means that our machine learning model is going to learn using data which is labeled That means the data is already tagged with the correct answer Supervised learning can be divided into two main parts, classification and regression. We use classification when we want our machine learning model to predict between two or more classes, like classifying images if they belong to a certain person or not. In regression, we are interested in predicting a certain value, like trying to predict the temperature next month. We will focus on classification problems for now. Let's take this example. For instance, suppose you want to build a model to detect spam emails. Now the first step is to train the model with different types of emails like this. If the email makes unrealistic threats or demands, then it will be labeled as spam. If the email is asking for sensitive information, then it will be labeled as spam. If the email has mismatch or dodgy URL, then it will be labeled as spam. If not of the above, then it will be labeled as not spam. Now suppose after training the data, you have given a new email, say it includes suspicious links and ask to identify it. Since the model has already learned the features of spam emails from previous data and this time must use it wisely, it will first classify the email with the characteristics it learned and confirm the email as a spam email and put it in spam category. Teachable Machine is a web-based tool that makes creating machine learning models fast, easy and accessible to everyone. It allows you to train computer to recognize your own images, sounds and poses. To start using Teachable Machine, go to the website teachablemachine.withgoogle.com we will start with image based project which means that we are going to create a machine learning model that can classify different images click on get started select image project we are going to create a machine learning model that can classify pens and tissue boxes we will be taking images using the computer webcam Click on the webcam button. Click on the allow button to give the website access to use your webcam. Hold the pen in front of the webcam, then click on the button, hold to record. You need to take many sample pictures with different poses of the pen. Try at least taking 50 images. Let's rename these images from class 1 to pen.
Go to the block below and repeat the same thing for the tissue box. After taking the pictures, our data is ready for the model to start the training. Click on Train Model. It might take some time until it finishes training your model. On the preview block, you can test your model by showing the pen and the tissue box to the webcam and see if the model was able to classify them correctly. Try using different brands from the pen or the tissue box and verify your model accuracy. After revising the definition of machine learning and practicing creating one, let's go back to Python. See you in the next video. In this class, we are going to talk about strings. A string basically is a sequence of characters. In Python, strings are a special kind of type which is similar to sequence types. In many ways, strings behave in similar ways to lists, which we will discuss later in this course. We can create a string variable simply by assigning string data to it, which should be placed in a single or double quote, just like this example. One of the useful functions that returns string data is the input function. We use it when we want to query the user for information. Let's try it. To print a new line within your string, you need to add a backslash with the letter N, just like this example. These special characters are called escape sequences and it allows us to denote characters which cannot be typed easily on a keyboard. Just like any sequence-based data types, we can access strings data through something called indexing and slicing. Each of a string's characters correspond to an index number, starting with the index number zero. For the string, how are you? The index breakdown looks like this. As you can see, the first character, H, starts at an index 0, and the string ends at an index 11, with the question mark symbol. We also notice that the white space character between how, are, and you also corresponds with its own index number. In this case, the index numbers associated with the white spaces are 3 and 7. The question mark also has an index number associated with it. Any other symbol or punctuation mark, such as these signs, is also a character and would be associated with its own index number. The fact that each character in Python string has a corresponding index number allows us to access and manipulate strings in the same way as we can with other sequential data types. By referencing index numbers, we can isolate one of the characters in a string. We do this by putting the index numbers in square brackets. Let's declare a string variable and assign the value how are you to it and print it. Now let's try calling the index number in square brackets that correspond to the letter Y and print it. As you can see, Python returns the character that is in that position or index 8 in the string variable string underscore test, which is the letter Y. We can also access strings characters using negative indexing. This method is useful when we have a long string and we want to pinpoint an item towards the end, where we start counting backward from the end of the string, starting at the index number minus 1, as you can see. Let's try calling the index number in square brackets that correspond to the same letter Y using negative indexing and print it.
We can also call out a range of characters from the string instead of a single character using the slicing technique. With slices, we can call multiple character values by creating a range of index numbers separated by a colon. Say we would like to just print the word u from our previous string variable. You will perform the slicing command as follows. When constructing a slice as in 8 colon 11, the first index number is where the slice starts and it's included in the range. And the second index number is where the slice ends, but it's executed from the range. Which is why in our example above, the range has to be the index number that would occur just after the string ends. When slicing strings, we are creating substring, which is essentially a string that exists within another string. When we call this string variable, we are calling the substring u that exists within the string how are you. If you want to call, let's say, the first five characters in a string, you do not need to specify the starting index and you can leave it empty. For example, let's try printing the word how in our string variable. We can do the same thing for printing, let's say, the character within index 5 till the end of the string by leaving the ending index empty like this example. We can also control the steps of moving forward when we are applying slicing using strides. String slicing can accept a third parameter in addition to two index numbers. The third parameter specifies the stride, which refers to how many characters to move forward after the first character is retrieved from the string. So far, we have omitted the stride parameter and Python defaults to the stride of 1, so that every character between two index numbers is retrieved. Let's print the substring RU from our variable string using stride equal to 1. Remember that 4 is the first index number where the slice starts and it's included in the range. 12 is the second index number where the slice ends but it's excluded from the range and 1 is the stride which refers to how many characters to move forward after the first character is retrieved from the string. We can also do it in this way since the stride is equal to 1. Now let's change the stride to 2 and observe the output. In this video, we learned what is string data type and how can we access its data using indexing and slicing. In the next video, we will learn string operators and if strings. See you in the next video. In this class, we are going to talk about different string operators and the if string. There are many built-in functions in Python which perform operations on strings. The simplest is concatenation, which basically means joining two strings together. We can apply concatenation using the plus sign. Let's create a string variable and assign your name to it. Then create another variable and assign your age to it. Now, if you try creating a new variable to store your info using the concatenation operation, Python will throw an error, basically because the second variable, my underscore age, is an integer and not a string. We can convert it to string using this function, as it shows here. This statement means that the new value of the variable, my underscore age, will be equal to the old value after converting it to string type. If you try applying concatenation this time, it will work. We can count how many characters the variable string has using the len function as it shows in this example. As you can see, the function returns 7 because we have 7 characters in the string variable myInfo. But remember its index starts from 0 and ends with 6 as we learned in the previous video. 
We can print the index of a character in the string using the index function. Let's say you want to know the index of the letter R in my previous string variable my underscore info. The command will be as follows. This will return number 2 because the index of the letter R in the string variable my underscore info is 2. Note that if you have the same character repeated in the string, the function will return the index of the first character encounter in that string as you can see. To count how many times a certain character repeated in a string, you can use the function count. Let's count how many times the character A repeated in the string variable my underscore info. You can also use the count function for counting substrings as you can see. We can omit any character or a substring from a string using the replace function. The function works as follows, where old is the string that you want to replace and new is the string to replace the old value with. Let's remove 30 from the string variable my underscore info and print it. The last operations we are going to learn on strings are the lower and upper operations. From the name of these operations, they can convert your string variable to lowercase or uppercase as it shows in this example. One more useful topic to talk about here related to strings is fstring. It's a string formatting mechanism known as literal string interpolation or more commonly as fstrings. It allows you to insert data into your string and manipulate it. Let's see this example. I have created two string variables to store my name, and I have another string variable that should contain my full name. Now, to convert the last string variable to f string, we need to put the letter f before the text and place the variable names in the curly bracket within the new f string variable, as you can see. In this video, we learned operations on strings and we took examples how to use them. We also learned what is fstring and how to implement it within your code. See you in the next video. In this class, we talked about machine learning and supervised learning in particular and learned how to create a simple machine learning model. Moreover, we learned about string data types and how can we access them using indexing and slicing. Then we got introduced to different string operators and learned how to use them. After that, we talked about fstring. Our class project is as follows. Imagine that you are working in a top secret agency and your team communicate with each other using encrypted messages to prevent unauthorized people from reading these messages. One of your team members sent you an encrypted message as follows. You need to decrypt it in order to read the code in the original message. You need to make these adjustments step by step in order to retrieve the passcode correctly from that message. The program should ask the user to enter his or her name and print it in a new line as it shows. You need to use the F string. Replace all Z characters with number 2 in the encrypted message. Replace all K characters with H in the encrypted message. Create three new string variables as follows. A. The first one will store the first five characters from the new encrypted message. B. The second one will store the last nine characters from the new encrypted message. C. The third one will store the concatenation of A and B in order. Reverse the new string variable. 
Remove all O characters from the new encrypted message. See you in the next video. Hello everyone and welcome back. In this class, we are going to learn what conditional statements are and how to construct them in Python. Moreover, we will talk about their operators and Boolean expressions. But before that, we are going to talk about a very important element in any machine learning project, which is data. Machine learning uses algorithms to continuously improve itself over time. But this requires feeding those models with data or datasets to learn from. To understand what a dataset is, we must first discuss the components of a dataset. A single row of data is called an instance. Datasets are a collection of instances that all share a common feature or an attribute. Machine learning models will generally contain few different datasets, each used to fulfill various roles in the system. These datasets are absolutely essential to the development of any machine learning model. The data you use will define your project, so a clear understanding of how it works will drastically improve your chances of success. The majority of datasets will contain pairs of input information and corresponding labeled answers. In sentiment analysis, for example, the dataset is usually composed of sentences, reviews, or tweets as the input with the label indicating whether the piece of text is positive or negative. In image recognition, the input would be the image, while the label suggests what is contained with the image. In spam detection, the input is an email or text message, while the label would provide information about whether the message is spam or not spam. Data set in machine learning projects are split into three categories. Training data, validation data, and testing data. Training data is the part of your data which you use to train your machine learning model to make prediction. Usually, it consists of 70% to 80% of your whole data set. When providing the model with training data, we give it both the inputs and their corresponding outputs to learn from. Validation data is a small part of your data set used to validate the model by using the examples in this set to tune the hyperparameters of the model and tackle challenges such as overfitting. Testing data is to test whether your model will work in real world or not. This is done by showing the model data example that it has never seen before and analyzing its predictions. You can either generate your own datasets or acquire them from different resources. For example, if you are interested in images, you can check the ImageNet datasets where you can download and use these datasets in your project. After understanding what datasets are, let's go back to Python. See you in the next video. Hi again, everyone. We are now going to start with the key concept in all programming and even our lives, and that is decision making. Everything we do in our everyday life involves some kind of a decision from something as simple as choosing what to eat for breakfast to choosing what you want to study in college. Now, we make those decisions based on a lot of conditions that we consider. Depending on those conditions, we choose if we want to do this or that. So, if I'm not too hungry, I will eat a banana. But if I am, I will have some eggs. Seems kind of simple but it's the basics of any decision. We first evaluate a condition, and then, depending on what the output of that condition is, we make our decision. This concept is what drives the majority of all codes around the planet. Conditional statements and decision-making in Python is what we will be covering today. To understand the flow of conditional statements, or what's also known as if-else conditions, 
Let's take a look at this diagram. In very general terms, let's look at a scenario where you are applying for college. The condition that we are evaluating in this diagram is, are you interested in computer software or in computer hardware? If you are interested in software, you will take the action, fill in an application for computer science. But if you are interested in hardware, you will take the action of fill in an application for computer engineering. Then you will continue and submit your application. This is a simple form of the if statement. Let's look at how to implement something like this in Python. Let's say we have a variable called word and we want to print it if it has the word hello. The code will look like this. Most of the programming languages like C, C++, or Java use braces to define a block of code. Python, however, uses indentation, which refers to the spaces at the beginning of a code line. In the previous example, the spaces before the code print word is mandatory, and it defines the action if the previous statement is true. In our college example, we did not account for if you are not interested in either of the choices. What would you do then? To cover this, we can include an action for any other input that was not in the options. Our diagram becomes like this. The else has to come after an if statement, and it will cover all other possibilities that were not included in the if statement. In our code, if the word is not hello, the program will do nothing. Let's add an else statement and observe the changes. What would be the output for the following codes? You can pause the video and try to guess the answer. With those couple of examples, we now have a general idea how FL structures work. Now let's get into more details. Python offers relational operators to compare the values of variables. These operators are equals, not equals, less than, less than or equal to, greater than, greater than or equal to. Python also has Boolean operators to combine more than one conditional statements together. These logical operators are AND, which return true if both statements are true, OR, which returns true if one of the statements is true, NOT, reverse the result so it returns false if the result is true. Let's look at a new example. We have a variable called number and we want to check if this is a positive number and is less than or equal to 1000. You can pause the video and try to code it. As you can see, in the above example, if the condition evaluates both statements, the first one, number greater than or equal to zero, returns the value false, and the second one, number less than or equal to 1000, returns the value true. But because they are linked with an AND operator, all the statements have to be true for the entire IF condition to return it true and execute the print command, the number is in the range. On the other hand, the OR operator needs only one of the statements to be true for the entire IF condition to return true. This applies to as many statements as you need to include. Let's take another example and try to detect if there are any problems with it or if we can improve it to become more efficient. This simple code checks a variable word for four sentences. The issue here, when the code finds which sentence it is, 
It does not stop checking and those checks are redundant as we already found the sentence and we know that all other check will return false. This means we are using computing resources and time inefficiently. And this is critical for big applications and codes that you might encounter in your next advanced courses. To counter this, we use LF, which is short for else if. This means that only check the next condition if the current one returned false. LF is also critical in evaluating another condition after an if statement as it does not just execute whatever under the LF, it checks again for a new condition, then it executes. When we modify our code, it will ignore all the following if statements after the one that finds the sentence as it chose. Let's now practice those concepts in a small challenge. Create two variables called length and width and write a code to print those variables if either the length or the width fall in the range of 1 to 100. Otherwise, let your code print none of the variable are in range. Before moving into more advanced techniques with if and else, we will look at one more detail, Boolean variables. Boolean variables are variables that hold either true or false only. Sometimes we refer to them as one or zero. We can use if and else statements to directly check their value. Check this example. The statement if flag means that if the variable flag is true or has a value 1. To check if the variable is not true or has the value 0, we use the reserved word not as it shows. The statement if not flag will return true only when the flag is 0, as not 0 is equal to 1. We will cover more examples and exercises where we can practice those concepts further in the next video. Welcome back everyone. We have now covered the basics of decision making and conditional statements. In this video, we will look at more advanced approaches using if and else and we will practice them through a couple of challenges. We will start by looking at nested if statements. These structures involve several if, lf, and else statements that are placed within one another. This allows us to create a tree-like hierarchy and a flowchart towards the final desired action. Let's look to understand this through an example. This is a flowchart for checking how much of discount is applied when you buying certain types of properties. At the start, we check the initial condition statement. Is the property a house or an apartment? Now, if the apartment is a house, no discount is applied. But if it is an apartment, there are several other conditions that we need to check in order to get the correct discount. And this is where we add more if statements. The statement, is the apartment above the fifth floor, will only be checked if the property is an apartment and so on for every statement below it. This demonstrates the nested if concepts. Let's take a look on how to implement this example in Python. You can pause the video and try to code it yourself. As you might have noticed, we have an F or LF statement for every diamond or condition shape in our diagram. Go ahead, change the property parameters and check if the code is behaving correctly. Python gives you another direct way to write a conditional statement. This technique is called tyranny operators and it involves three operands through expression followed with f, then the condition followed by the false expression as you can see. With this example, we now have all the basics to start with some challenges for practice. 
for our first exercise, we have five integer numbers from N1 to N5. We want to perform some operations on them and produce a final float number. If the sum of all the numbers is an odd number, check if the first number is bigger than the last number. If so, print the number N1 is bigger than N5. Else, print the number N5 is bigger than N1. You need to consider if they are equal. If the sum of all numbers is even, divide their sum by N1 and display the result. Be careful of dividing by zero. Create a special case to print can divide by zero before such a division takes place. It's always good to write up the algorithm of a challenge or a question before starting to code it. In this case, you can even create your own flowchart on a piece of paper before starting to code. With this example, we have completed our study of conditional statements. We will use these concepts in almost every code that we write, and we will see their importance when we cover loops and data structures in Python. I will see you in the next video to conclude our class and work through our class project. Hello and welcome back. As always, in this final video, we will summarize our class and work through our class project. We started in this class by talking about the importance of data and the role it plays in the development of machine learning models. We talked about data sets and the difference between training, validation, and testing data. We then moved to the conditional statements in Python and how they control the flow of our code. We covered F, LF, and else statements. We talked about the different types of operators and learned how to do nested if statements. We also practiced these concepts through a couple of examples and challenges. Now in our class project, let's take a look at this diagram and try to implement it in Python. See you in the next video. Hello everyone and welcome back. We have been doing really well in our progress toward learning how to program in Python while explore different AI activities and concepts. In the next two classes, we will dive into gaming. Specifically, we will talk about intelligent game development and a very interesting area in AI called reinforcement learning. Video games are one of the most interesting areas for programmers and developers. Developing a video game can be as or even more interesting than playing it. Today, video games are a hundred billion dollar industry. For the graphics to the story and the gameplay, there are many aspects that make you enjoy playing a game. But we are only interested in one thing today, how to win. Video games can be very challenging at times, and that's mainly because of how many factors and variables you need to consider while you play a game. Every move you make can affect your score and ultimately lead to you winning or losing the game. Such an environment sounds like the perfect scenario for AI to step in. AI has proven its powers very clearly when it comes to beating humans at video games. Today, we have come a long way in terms of computing power, which now allows for much more complex AI algorithms to be implemented. Google's DeepMind team has developed AI agents that have reached superhuman levels of playing Atari games. This graph shows a comparison between their AI algorithm and the human-level performance on 57 different Atari games. 
Such a concept sounds very interesting, but can we benefit from coding an algorithm that can play a game better than us? It turns out that yes, we can. One of the most basic ways of utilizing those algorithms is in game development itself. Integrating hardcore game modes allows for more competitiveness and excitement in the game's progression and even the gameplay experience. Another major benefit and a rather interesting one is us humans learning how to play games better by observing these algorithms. Electronic sports or esports is the field of professional gaming, an industry that is projected to reach $1.8 billion by 2022. Teams have started to invest in AI algorithms to coach their players, optimize their team's performance, and even draft strategies and tactics. I hope this small introduction was enough to get you curious about how all of those AI algorithms work and how they are developed. In our next AI video, we will get a closer look at what reinforcement learning is and how it reached superhuman levels in gaming. Hi everyone and welcome back the course. With the interesting introduction to AI in gaming that we watched in the previous video, we will transition and start learning a couple of new data structures to use in our codes that will help us organize, manipulate, and handle data. Up until now, we have only been dealing with single variables, variables that have a single value assigned to them, whether it's an integer number or a string. Each variable we created had only one item. But what if we want to group data together and create more advanced structures, such as list of numbers for a phone book or list of items for a shopping list? In this class, we will look at lists, tuples, and dictionaries in Python and understand the difference between each one and how to code and implement them in our codes. Let's start with lists. Lists in Python are data structures that we use to collect any type or number of variables and objects. They are one of the most used data structures in Python and that's because of how flexible and dynamic they can be. We will now look at their characteristics and how to implement them in Python. List elements are ordered. This means that when the list is created, the order in which the items are inserted to it is maintained as long as the list exists. Lists behave very similar to strings, as you are going to see in the next few examples. If two lists have the same items but in different order, then those two lists are not the same. Let's create two lists. In this example, we create the list and populate them at the same time. Each item in that list exists in this specific order. List can be accessed by their index. The list index starts from zero for the first item in that list. And every item in that list can be accessed using its index, which is its order in that list. List underscore A index this code here allows you to access any element in the list by choosing its index as you can see. In our example, the last print statement first retrieves the element with index 5 from list underscore a, then adds one to it. What do you think the result would be for the following two codes? For the first print line, the code will retrieve the third element in the list that holds the index 2, which is number 13, then add 1 to it. For the second print line, the code will throw an error as index 6 is out of range as you can see. You can also index a list using negative indexing as well. This means that you are indexing the list from its end as it shows in this example. 
You can specify a range as an index to retrieve multiple items from the list using the slicing technique as you can see. Create a new list and assign these values to it as it shows. List can contain any arbitrary objects. A list is not restricted to have one type for all of its items. Each item in the list can be of a different type. Lists can also host complex objects, such as functions, class objects, and even other lists. They can also contain duplicates as we can see. Lists can be nested. There is no limit on how many lists you can have within other lists, but it's important to carefully understand your structure in order not to get confused. As you can see, list underscore C contains list underscore A in its index 2. In the print statement, we are printing the item with index 3 in list underscore A, which is located in the second index of list C. This is a simple example of nested lists. We can use this to our advantage in many scenarios such as creating two or three dimensional lists. Lists are immutable data structures. Once a list is created, you can modify the list in every possible way. You can move, add, delete, and shift its items. We will practice those operations through examples and challenges in this class. The next example will show us some of the functions that are associated with lists. You can look up a list of all the available functions by visiting this website. Let's practice few of these functions. The append method adds a single item to the end of the list. The pop method removes the item at the given index from the list and returns the removed item. The insert method inserts an element to the list at the specified index. We can use the count function to count how many times a given object occurs in a list, just like what we did in strings. The final and very beneficial characteristic of lists is that they are dynamic. This means that you do not need to set the size of the list when it's first defined. The list can grow and shrink as you need to. In this example, we are creating an empty list, then we are manipulating with its elements using the functions we saw earlier. Now let's practice lists with this challenge. Create a list called grocery underscore items and add five different items to it. Create a list called prices and add the price of every item in list grocery underscore items in order. Print every item next to its price. Remove three items from both lists, then add two new items from the start locations of the lists. You can pause the video and try to do it yourself.
That sums up our first data structure of this class. We will now move on to our second structure type, which are tuples. Tuples are identical to lists, except in two ways. Tuples are immutable, which means that they cannot be modified in any way once they are created. And the second difference is in their definition syntax. A tuple is created using parentheses instead of square brackets, but it's important to know that they are still accessed using square brackets as you can see in this example. Now you might ask, why would we use a tuple if we cannot edit it at all? Well, there are several benefits to having such a structure. Sometimes you want to create data that cannot be modified through your code. Using tuple in this case will ensure that and will protect your data from accidental modifications. From a performance point of view, program execution is faster when dealing with tuples than when dealing with lists. And finally, some data structures such as dictionaries require immutable objects as one of their components. Hence, that component can be a tuple. That's all for this video. You can practice and look up different functions that can be applied to lists and tuples. But for now, we will move on to the next video to cover dictionaries. See you then. Hi everyone and welcome back. In this video, we will talk about the second part of our data structures covering dictionaries. Dictionaries are another data structure that allows us to organize and store data. They are similar to lists in that they are dynamic, mutable, and can be nested, but differ from lists in the way they are created, accessed, and that they are unordered. The key difference is that dictionaries have keys for every element, and the key is what we use to access elements in a dictionary, as we cannot access dictionary elements using their index. Let's look at how to define and access them. In this example, our keys are the countries and the values are the capitals. You can display the content of an existing dictionary by simply printing it. You can also define dictionaries using the built-in dict function, where you specify the key value pair like this. As we said before, we cannot access a dictionary element by using its index. An error will occur if you try to do so. If you want to access a specific element in the dictionary, you need to specify its corresponding key as it shows. You can modify elements in the dictionary by accessing them through their keys too, as you can see. We can add an entry to dictionary that exists by specifying the new key and value for that entry as it shows in this example. To delete an entry, we use the reserved word del and specify the entry to be deleted using its key as you can see. Now let's practice by creating our dictionary. Create your own dictionary that includes your favorite food items as keys and the list of their ingredients as the values for each. You can pause the video and try to do it yourself.
Remember, just like lists, the values in a dictionary do not need to be of the same type. You can also have nested dictionaries or dictionaries that contain lists and lists of lists. Be careful, a key can only appear once in a dictionary. Duplicate keys are not allowed. If you specify the same key twice in a dictionary, the second will override the first as you can see. You also need to remember that dictionary keys must always be of an immutable type, such as integer, string, boolean, or as we talked about in the previous video, tuples too as they are immutable objects. Let's now look at some operations that we can do on dictionaries. You can use the len function to return the length of a dictionary. Dictionaries have built-in functions that we can call for each object of type dict. Let's look at a couple of common functions for dictionaries. The keys method returns the keys of the dictionary as a list. The values method returns the values of the dictionary as a list. The pop method removes an element from the dictionary using its key. The get method returns the value of the item with the specified key. Let's now practice those operations on the food dictionary that we created earlier. And with that, we have covered three of the most useful data structures that we can use in Python. You can always research more and find out what other advanced structures the Python has and what are their benefits and uses. I will see you in the final video of this class to conclude our work and talk about the class project. Hi everyone and welcome back. Well done on finishing one more important class in our course. In this class, we covered three of the most important data structures in Python. Lists, dictionaries, and tuples. We learned how to implement and code these structures, and why they are very useful in handling and storing our data. Now let's implement a class project to practice those concepts. We want to store some information about four NBA basketball teams. For each team, we want to create a dictionary that has the following information. A list of all the player names. A list indicating the result for their last five matches. This has to be a nested dictionary with dates as the keys and a pool value where one is a win and zero is a loss. Their hometown the number of NBA titles they have won. Once you have created the dictionary, use the dictionary function that we had learned to add, modify, or delete entries from those dictionaries. Well done on finishing this class. See you in the next one. Last class, we start talking about the impact of AI in video gaming and how some AI algorithms have reached superhuman levels in certain games. In our class today, we will continue that discussion and talk about reinforcement learning and how this concept is used in video gaming and many other fields. We will then try and take on a reinforcement learning agent and feed it at a game. After that, we will learn a new concept in Python called loops, and we will learn how this concept unlocks tons of possibilities for our codes. We will also practice this concept in a couple of interesting challenges and examples. So let's get into it. Let's start by asking ourselves, what is reinforcement learning, or in short, RL? Reinforcement learning is an area in machine learning that involves an agent, an environment, and the interactions between them. The goal of the RL 
is to train an agent to become an expert in its environment. The agent's goal is to maximize the reward it receives from the environment by learning what are the best actions it should take in certain states of the environment. This might sound complicated, but we will break it down through an example. Let's look at an example for a self-driving car in a straight neighborhood street. The reinforcement learning agent in this case is the car, and the environment is the street. The goal is to train the car to drive from the start to the end of the street. The car has knowledge of the set of actions it can take, which are gas, brake, and turning the steering wheel. Every action the car takes in the street results in a new state of the car. For simplicity, we will assume that the car can observe the distance left to the end of the road and the sidewalks. Now the agent can have zero knowledge about what the goal is and zero knowledge about the environment dynamics. This is called model-free reinforcement learning. We will learn more about the different types of RL in future course. Up until now, this seems like an impossible task for the car. How do you think the car can build the knowledge to drive across the street safely? Well, for every action the car takes in the environment, it receives a reward value. This value shows the car that the action it took in this state was a good or a bad one. For example, if the car moves forward and does not hit anything, the environment sends a positive reward. But if the car turns and speeds toward the sidewalks, it receives a very bad reward. Through those trials and using advanced machine learning algorithm, the car can build the knowledge and find the correct policy to use to choose the proper action that will maximize its final reward. We can apply the same concept to video games, medical applications, computer security and even space exploration. To give you a taste on how good these algorithms can get, we will try to beat an RL agent in the game of Super Mario. In this game, the agent is Mario and the environment is everything within the game. The agent has learned through millions of training cycles how to play this game in the optimal way to finish each level in the shortest time possible. You will now try to play the game to finish level 1 faster than the RL agent can. The agent finished level 1 with 347 seconds left on the clock. Can you beat that? See you in the next video. Hi everyone! In all of the AI activities that we have done previously, coding is a major skill and tool to have when we want to develop or implement AI algorithms. And in this class, we will start to learn about loops and practice them through examples and challenges. So, what are loops? The word itself refers to repetition, and that's exactly what the concept is. A loop is a repetition of sequence of instructions until a certain condition is achieved. Let's introduce the for loop to solve this example. We have a list of numbers and we want to find if a certain number appears in the list or not. One way of doing this can be going over every number in the list and checking if it is the number that we are looking for. We can terminate the search once we have gone over all the numbers in the list. We can use the for loop in Python to iterate over any sequence. The sequence can be a list, dictionary, set, tuple, or even a string. We set a temporary variable to be assigned to the elements in the list and iterate over them. In our previous example, the variable was num. Now, we can definitely make our code better. What the code does now is even if it finds the number in the first entry of the list, it keeps searching all the other entries as it shows. What we want to do is to stop the loop if the number is found. This will save us time and computing resources. To do so, we use the break statement. The break statement immediately results in exiting the current loop and moving on with the code as you can see. One more statement that can be used with the for loop is the continue statement. 
which allows you to stop the current iteration of the loop or skip it and move on the next iteration without exiting the loop as it shows in this example. Try modify our number searching code to show you the index where the number is found. Also try to modify it to detect duplicates and count them as well. You can pause the video and try to do it yourself. Let's now move on the second type of loops in Python, the while loop. The while loop continually executes as long as its condition is satisfied. Let's examine this type with an example. Assume we have a list of weights that we want to put in a box to be moved. Now the box can only hold a maximum of 100 kg. We want to keep adding items to the box as long as the sum of their weight stays below 100 kg. Let's take a look at one way to solve this challenge using a while loop. As you can see, the code worked. Now let's try and improve on our code. Let's see if you can modify the code to print a list of the individual item weights in the box. We can even make it better by adding one more advanced feature. Can you modify the code to fit in the most number of items in the box? Explore these challenges and we will meet in the next video to talk about the nested loops. Hello everyone and welcome back. Let's pick up our work on loops. I hope that you enjoyed attempting the challenges of the last video. What we will do now is talk about nested loops, which basically means adding a loop inside another one. This allows the code inside the inner loop to be executed one time for every time the outer loop executes, as you can see in this example. Let's practice nested loops a bit more with a game. Assume you have a list of multiplication totals and another set of numbers. The game is to find all the pairs from the list numbers that can produce every total in the list totals when multiplied with each other. Let's go over one way to solve this challenge together using nested loops. To understand this code, for the operation 9 multiply 9 equal 81 in the first output line, the variable total in the first loop will start with the value 81 as you can see, and when we go to the second loop, the variable number 1 will start with the value 1, and the variable number 2 will start with the value 1 as well in the third loop. The if statement will check the condition number 1 multiply number 2 equal total which is false for this iteration, so it will not print and the variable number 2 will update it to the second element in the list numbers 2 and check again. The third loop will iterate over all the values in the list numbers 2 and when this iteration is over, the second loop will update the variable number 1 to the second element in the list numbers 1 and this process will be repeated until it iterates over all the elements in the list as you can see.
When the variable number 1 reaches the element 9 in the list numbers 1 in the second loop and the variable number 2 reaches the element 9 in the list numbers 2 in the third loop, the if statement will return true. Remember that the variable total is still 81, hence the code will print 9 multiply 9 equal 81. When both variables number 1 and number 2 reach 260, the first loop will update the total variable to the second element in the totals list, and the same process is repeated until it iterates over the whole range. This example highlighted the power of nested loops when we want to iterate over several combinations. Go ahead and improve on this code to only display one possibility for each number in the totals list. You can pause the video and try to code it yourself. That's all for the basics of loops in Python. I will see you in our class summary video to conclude our work. In this class, we started to learn about AI in gaming and how this concept has reached superhuman levels in playing video games. We mentioned the term reinforcement learning and how it is the concept behind most of the AI algorithms in gaming. We will understand and define this term in our next class. We moved on to continue our work with coding and introduce the concept of loops. We covered for and why loops, the break and continue statements, nested loops and we practice them through our challenges. Now to combine all these concepts together, we have two class projects. In the first class project, we want to write a code that given a one word string, fun robotics, will give us the following output. For the second project, we want to write a code to display a diamond shape as shown using nested loops. See you in the next class. Hi everyone and welcome back. As always, in this class, we will talk about a very interesting and useful machine learning concept that we use frequently without noticing that we are using it. After that, we will learn what are functions and modules and how to use them in Python. So let's get started. We now know that machine learning has three main categories, supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning. Supervised learning was where the ML algorithm is trained using labeled data, and that meant that the inputs and outputs of the provided data are labeled, and the model can predict outputs and classify inputs into known categories, such classifying images of vehicles into cars or trucks, or predicting the temperature for the next week. We also talked about reinforcement learning, where we learned that any reinforcement learning algorithm is composed of an environment, an agent in the environment, and the interactions between them. The goal of the agent is basically to find the best set of actions to take in the environment to maximize its long-term rewards. We looked at examples of how these concepts revolutionized the use of AI in games and allowed algorithms to reach superhuman levels. What we will do today is introduce unsupervised learning and look at a couple of its most important applications in our everyday life. So, what is unsupervised learning? Unsupervised machine learning algorithms infer patterns from a dataset without reference to known or labeled outcomes. Unlike supervised machine learning, unsupervised machine learning methods cannot be directly applied to regression or a classification problem because you have no idea what the values for the output data might be, making it impossible for you to train the algorithm the way you normally would. Unsupervised learning can instead be used to discover the underlying structure of the data. This basically means that we have data that we don't know much about and want to extract patterns and knowledge from it in order to engineer a solution or enhance something about the topic at hand. Now this might still seem complicated, 
but will try and uncover the benefits of unsupervised learning through a couple of examples. The most common type of unsupervised learning is called clustering, which is grouping similar objects or data points together to form clusters. These algorithms do not really know what those clusters are, but they can figure out that the objects within them are very similar to each other. Let's look at how useful something like this can be. Spam filters. Our emails today are heavily filtered as our inboxes get flooded with spam emails that range from commercials and promotions to even virus and malicious emails. Clustering is used to identify to which category an email belongs and organize our inboxes, keeping what matters always prioritized. Personalize ads. You might have noticed that the ads you usually get online are really of things that you are interested in and are related to your online activities. One of the reasons behind these customized ads is clustering algorithms that track your behavior online and cluster your profile with others who have similar behaviors. Now when those people buy or search things, the algorithm guesses that you might be interested in those things as well and show you ads about them. There are many more examples of clustering, such as filtering news and validating their correctness, clustering driving behaviors, or even deciding which players might be best for certain sports team. Now let's step forward into Python again and start with our new topic. See you in the next video. Hi everyone and welcome back. In this class, we will talk about functions and modules in Python. These two concepts will help us in organizing our codes to become more readable and well-organized. When you start creating complex codes for advanced problems, the size of your codes becomes an issue. Ensuring that your codes are readable and efficiently written is a must-do task. Through functions and modules, we will solve this problem and pave the way for more advanced code structures. Let's start with functions. Functions are blocks of codes that you create to do a specific task within your code. We create functions for lines of codes that we expect to repeat a lot. By doing so, we avoid cluttering our code and make it much easier to read and understand. Another key benefit of functions is that they break our code into small pieces where each piece has its own functionality. And this is great for debugging the code to find problems and even to enhance and upgrade it. To create a function, use the word def, then the function name followed by parentheses and a colon as you can see. Indented under it, you can write the code that you want your function to execute. This function has only one job, which is to print the sentence, my first function does not do much. Now, this function will not run in our code unless it is called. You can call a function with its name as it's shown. Functions can have parameters as well. Parameters are the way to pass information to functions to be used within them. You can add as many parameters as you need inside the parentheses after the function's name where it's defined. When we want to pass a value to the function, you pass it when you call the function, and this is called an argument. In the above definition, my function has a parameter called name. When we call the function, we can pass an argument to it, and in this case, it's bara. You must pass the exact number of arguments that the function can take. Any more or less can result in an error. We will learn more about parameters and arguments in advanced classes. When defining a parameter for a function, you can include a default value for it. So, if we call that function without passing a value for that parameter, the function will use the default value. Now, let's practice what we have learned so far with the small exercise. Create a function that takes the first name, last name, and the year of birth then calculates the age and prints the information. Include default values for all the parameters. You can pause the video and try to do it yourself.
So far, we have covered functions that perform a specific task but do not provide us back with values. In other words, functions that do not return anything. To make a function return a value, we use the word return within the function body followed by anything that we want the function to return. We can assign the value that the function returns to a variable as well as you can see in this example. A quick thing to mention is that function definitions should not be empty. If for any purpose you want to leave a function definition empty, you can use the word pass as it shows in this example. Let's practice all those concepts with an exercise. Define a function that takes the mark of a student and the course name and prints their grade. You can pause the video and try to do it yourself. Test your function with several function calls. We will now move on to modules. You can think of modules as collections of codes, where you can define functions, variables, and even write statements to be used with other scripts and applications when they are imported. A module is just like any other Python file. It has a name and a .py extension. Each module has its own scope for naming, so you can have identically named functions in different modules. We import modules into our code by using the word import followed by the name of the module. You can rename the module locally like this. Import module name as m1. You also can import specific functions from the module rather than importing all of it to your code like this. From module name import function 1. We now have what we need to create well structured codes. I will see you in the next class to create our own modules and look at what built-in modules Python has. Hello everyone. Let's continue from where we left off talking about modules. Let's start by creating our own module and name it my underscore module one. In this file, we will add two functions and a variable as it shows. Now, in a new file within the same directory, let's create our code. We start by importing our module import my underscore module one. Once we do so, now we can access the functions and the variables by using the module name followed by dot then the function or the variable as you can see. We can use this technique to define all our functions in a file and then use another file for our main code. Python comes with many built-in modules that provide a lot of useful functionalities for our codes. We will go over a couple of them and then we will practice those concepts through the class project in the next video. We will start with date-time module. 
This module is one of the most commonly used for dealing with time and date. Let's import the module and assign the current date and time to an object. The star after the word import indicates that we want to import everything in the module. In this example, datetime.now will return the current date and time from the module datetime and store it in the variable date underscore time underscore now. We can use the time delta function to shift any part of the date or time. Let's shift the days by one. We can shift them back as well. Let's go back 10 days. You can always visit the Python documentation for a list of everything any module has. Our second module is the math module. It gives you access to a lot of math functionalities to use directly, such as finding the square root of a number, calculating factorials, and much more. The math.pow returns the value of x raised to the power y. The math.sqrt returns the square root for the number x. The math.floor returns the largest integer not greater than the number x. The math.seal returns the smallest integer value greater than the number x. The math.factorial returns the factorial of desired number x. Another very useful module is random, which includes pseudo-random number generators for various distributions. The random.randit returns an integer number from the specified range x to y. The random.random returns a random floating number between 0 and 1. That's all for this video about modules. I will see you next to summarize our class and discuss the class project. Hi everyone! Well done on completing this class. We started by going into more details about AI and video games, where we learned more about reinforcement learning and how it's used to learn different environments and build the knowledge to solve them. We tried to beat an RL agent in the game of Super Mario to experience how good an RL agent can perform after its trained. Then we moved to Python programming and covered functions and modules, finishing with useful built-in modules that we can utilize. Now, to practice these concepts, we will go over three class projects and implement what we have learned so far. For this class project, write a code to do the following. We looked at the built-in math module, write two functions, one to import a factorial calculation, and another given a and b to calculate a to the power of b. Write these functions in a module of your own, then write a main file to test your functions. To test them, import the math module, and give matching inputs to both your module function and the function from the math module. Then print, the functions are correct if the outputs are a match, and the functions have errors if the outputs do not match. We need you to write a function to solve this programming challenge. A small boat can carry four people and a captain. Your function should take an integer number of people and return the number of boats needed to allow everyone to travel. Create a function that will randomly travel in time. This function generates 100 random numbers between minus 1000 and 1000. And for each random number, it moves the current day according to that number. The function returns the modified date call the function and see what date do you land on. 
Well done and I will see you in the next class. Hi everyone and welcome back. In our class today we will talk about very interesting area in machine learning called neural network. And then we will try one of the applications that uses neural network and its implementation and understand how it works. We will then switch to Python and learn how to deal with writing and reading data from external files. And while doing so, we will cover almost all the concepts in Python that we have covered previously. So let's get into it. In nature, our brains are meshes of neurons that are connected together to form a very large network. And inspired by our brains, computer scientists were able to develop algorithms that are made up of neurons interconnected to other neurons, which form a network just like the structure of our brain. These are called Artificial Neural Networks or ANN and they are the answers to making computers more human-like and help machines reason more like us. Artificial neural networks, unlike our brain cells, use different layers of mathematical processing to make sense of the information it's fed. Typically, an artificial neural network has anywhere from dozens to millions of artificial neurons called units, arranged in a series of layers. The input layer receives various forms of information from the outside world. This is the data that the network aims to process or learn about. From the input unit, the data goes through one or more hidden units. The hidden unit's job is to transform the input into something the output unit can use. For instance, imagine that a fire took place in your apartment and quickly you start thinking of what is most valuable to save. Essential documents, jewelry, laptop, a pencil. Now, you only have a few minutes to get out of the apartment and you can only save a few things. What will your priorities be in this case? Perhaps you are going to save your documents first and then, if time permits, you can think of other things. What you did here is you assigned a weight to your valuables. Each of the valuables at that moment is an input and the priorities are the weight you assigned it to it. ANN represents interconnected input and output units in which each connection has an associated weight. During the learning phase, the network learns by adjusting these weights in order to be able to predict the correct class for input data. Let's try one of the activities that uses artificial neural network. Go to the following website. AI Do It is a fun machine learning experiment that lets you play melodies on your computer's keyboard and the computer will then try to play a do it with you. Simply click play and start playing the notes on your keyboard and the ML model will play along with you. See you in the next class. Hi everyone and welcome back. In this video, we will learn how to read from and write to external files. This is a very important functionality to understand and learn to do correctly. As we almost always need to acquire data into our codes from a certain source and then write the results back to it. For example, Let's think of a simple code that can calculate the overall grade for all the students in a certain course. Now we need to read all their coursework and exam marks from an external file. Then write the results back as well. Another example would be dealing with very large data files such as weather data or inventory for stores and so on. All of this data is always stored in files or datasets that need to be read into our code for processing. And in this class, we will learn the basics of reading and writing to text files. When we deal with files, there are three main things that specify the file, the folder path, the file name, and the file extension. 
Let's start by opening a file that already exists in the same directory of the notebook file. This line will open the file randomnumbers.txt as long as the file exists and is located in the same directory of your Anaconda environment. This is because we did not specify the folder path for the file and we only gave our code the file name and its extensions. If we want to open any file within our local system, we have to provide the full path for the folder with the letter R, which means row string as it shows. It's very important to close a file after finishing your work with it. You can do so by calling the close function on the file object. When we open a file, we can specify in which way we want to open it. We will look at different options of handling files in the next video. In this class and at our level, we will focus on text files. After our file is opened, let's see what are the ways that we can read the content of that file. The read method returns the specified number of bytes from the file. The default is minus one, which means the whole file. In this example, we are reading the first four characters in the file and printing them, which are number 45, the new line, and digit 4. Remember that new lines are considered characters as we saw earlier when we covered strings. The read line method returns one line from the file. Note that all read commands continue reading the file from where it stopped. That's why this read line code printed the number 56. If you run the same code again, it will print the next line in the file. You can also specify how many characters to be read from the line as you can see. The read lines method returns a list containing the remaining lines from the file as it shows. Again, the backslash n means new line as we saw before. When reading a file, the read functions automatically know the end of file or EOF. Python will raise an exception if the EOF cannot be reached for some reason. You can also explicitly check if the EOF is reached by checking what the read functions return. If the value they returned is an empty string, then the EOF has reached. Let's see how to practice those functions with an example. We have a file called groceryitems.txt. Let's read its content using the read function and print it. Now let's try and read the entire file using readline and readlines functions and see how each function operates. Well done! We now know how to open and read information from a text file. Let's see if we can tackle this challenge which will also help us in reviewing some of our previous topics, such as data structures and loops. We have a file called randomnumbers.txt. This file has a number at every line. What we want to do is to read those numbers and sort them in both ascending and descending orders without using any built-in sorting functions. When the number are sorted, we want to print them to the console. You can pause the video and try to do it yourself.
Well then again, I will see you in the next video to study writing to files and practice more with examples and challenges. Hi everyone and welcome back. We have so far covered how to open and read from text files. In this video, we will look at how to write information to an external file. For writing to files, we might want to create a file, then write to it, and this is done using the same open command with the letter X as its mode. If the file exists, Python will return an error. Instead, we can choose to overwrite its content by changing the mode to W, or append its content by using the mode A as it shows. I want to remind you again to always close your files. Just like reading, we have two functions for writing to files. The write method writes a specified text to the file. The write lines method writes the items of a list to the file. To quickly practice writing, let's write the sorted numbers from our last video to a new file called sorted.txt. Note that you need to convert the list to string as the write method accepts only string inputs. You can pause the video and try to do it yourself. To practice both reading and writing, we will do one more challenge before moving on to the final video of our class to discuss our class project. In our challenge now, we have this paragraph. We want to save it in a text file, read the text file into our code, and generate a count for every letter in this paragraph. Then we want to count the vowels and the consonants that appear in the paragraph. Finally. We want to write those statistics back to the same file by appending them under the paragraph. You can pause the video and try to do it yourself. I will see you in the next video to summarize our work and discuss the class project. Hi everyone, and well done on finishing one more class from our course. In this class, we started by uncovering another AI concept and very interesting one, which is neural networks. We then moved on to talk about how we handle external files in Python. We learned how to read from and write to text files. We practiced those concepts through a couple of challenges. Now we will discuss our class project. In this project, we have a file that resembles an assignment submission for a student. And our goal is to mark this file and append the final mark to it. The file is as follows. The first line contains the student's name and the second line has the number of the assignment. The remaining lines represent the answer of the student. Each correct line has a mark of 1, and if the line is incorrect, the mark for that line is 0. 
we want to append both the grade of the student and their mistakes to the same file. For example, in our text file, the code should generate the following text and append it to the file. This example will cover a lot of the concepts that we learned before and will give us a good practice on how to handle files. Well done and I will see you in the next class. Hello and welcome back everyone. In our class today, we will cover the very interesting concept of recommender systems under the field of data analytics. We will learn what this field is and how is it related to AI. We will also distinguish between the terms data science, data analytics, and artificial intelligence. Learning how to differentiate between those terms will help us towards learning how to prepare our data and extract information from it in order to build a very effective artificial intelligence and machine learning models. After our AI introduction, we will go back to Python and learn how to use the NumPy package. This package will help us to perform operations on data and extract statistics, as we are going to see in this class. What is data analytics? To understand what data analytics is, let's first differentiate between very common three terms, data science, data analytics, and machine learning. Data science is a huge field that focuses on designing and constructing algorithms, prototypes, and models to extract knowledge and key information from data. This field deals with the macro scale of data and includes subfields, such as machine learning, corporate analytics, and search engine engineering. Data analytics is more of a micro scale concept that aims at finding trends, creating visual representations, being a microscale field, it's used almost in every field to help build a better understanding of data. Such fields include medicine, gaming, and finance. As we have discussed before, machine learning is a field of creating mathematical models and algorithms that use data to self-improve and enhance their performance. With those three terms clarified, and as we have seen many examples of ML applications before, we will now look at a direct application of data analytics technique called recommender systems in our real life. Facebook, YouTube, Amazon, and Netflix have gained massive popularity in the past 10 years, and we almost interact with those platforms on an everyday basis. This is evident if we look at Facebook's nearly 2.45 billion monthly active users, and YouTube's 500 hours of video uploads per minute. These platforms and many more are experts at suggesting content to their users, from telling you what movies you might want to watch next, to showing you what products you would be interested in buying. Many algorithms are working hard behind the scenes to keep those recommendations relevant to their users. How do they do that? One way is by using recommender systems which are mathematical algorithms designed to process behavioral data and use it to suggest relevant items to their users. Let's get an idea on how these systems work. There are two main types of recommender systems, collaborative and content-based. These methods build arrays of numbers that indicate a relationship between items and users using advanced mathematical equations. We won't cover the math behind them now, but it's fun to understand what these two types are and we will cover them in more details in more advanced courses. Collaborative methods focus on past interactions between users and items. For example, in an online shopping app, a user has bought several car accessory items in the past. These methods work by generating a user item interaction matrix but suffer greatly from what we call the cold start problem, which is what would the method suggest to a brand new user, as this user has no past data. Content-based methods suffer much less from the cold start problem. This is because these methods do not just use used item information, but also try to build more insights using user or item features. 
For example, young users prefer watching more animation movies than older users. By including the age of the user as a feature, these methods can suggest movies to a brand new user by looking at their age. This was a quick introduction to recommender systems. In the next level, we will further explore how these methods are implemented and design our own recommender system for our applications. See you in the next video. Hello and welcome back everyone. We will start this video by talking about the NumPy package to learn more about processing data and performing scientific computations in Python. The NumPy package provides us with array and matrix objects with a large set of mathematical, logical, sorting, selecting, and basic linear algebra functions to perform on those objects. In this video, we will learn the properties of array objects and practice how to create and perform operations on them. So let's start. The center of the NumPy array is the ND array object, which is an object of an n-dimensional array. This object is not the same as the common Python sequences, such as lists. Let's look at how this object is different. NumPy arrays have a fixed size, unlike Python lists, which are dynamic in size. All elements of a NumPy array have to be of the same type. As NumPy arrays are used to deal with large sets of data, they are designed to perform operations on them in a much more efficient way than using the common Python data structures. The main array class of NumPy is called ND array, which is an array with n dimensions. Dimensions can also be called axis in NumPy. A class is a collection of variables and functions that you can instantiate several objects of. You can study classes as part of more advanced coding courses that cover object-oriented programming in more detail. The first thing we need to do is to import the NumPy library using the import command. Let's create a NumPy array and print it using the following command. Each in the array created has a set of very important attributes. These are some of the most common ones. ndarray.ndem This command indicates the number array dimensions. In our previous example, the array was a single dimension. ndarray.dtype which provides the type of data inside the array. Note that NumPy provides additional data types, such as numpy.int32 and numpy.float64, as you can see. And the array.size. This provides us with the total number of elements that exist in the array. And the array.shape. This provides us with a tuple that shows the size of the array in every dimension. The length or the shape of the tuple will be equal to the number of dimensions. Let's now create a small example and learn how to use NumPy within our codes. As we saw, the array function transforms sequences of sequences into two-dimensional arrays and further sequences into further dimensions. You can also specify the type of the array when creating, as you can see. If the type is not specified, it will be detected automatically according to the elements in the array. Other useful functions for creating arrays are zeros, ones, and empty. Zero creates an array of zeros with the specified dimensions as you can see and once you create an array of ones while empty creates an array with random content with the data type of float64 we can use the function arrange which is equivalent to range to fill the elements of the array with the specified range this is best used with integer numbers as when it's used with floats we cannot predict the number of elements that it will produce due to the finite floating point precision as you can see. To compact this, we can use the line space function where we can specify the total number of elements rather than the step size as it shows. In this example, we have specified the total number of elements to be five. We have now covered the basics of how to create NumPy arrays. Let's move on to the next video.
to learn about the operations that we can perform on these arrays. Hello and welcome back. In this video, we will learn about the most common and useful operations that we can perform in NumPy. So far, we have covered how to create an ND array object. Now, let's look at what we can perform on it. We can apply any arithmetic operation on arrays as an element-wise operation as you can see. Remember that we are dealing with arrays and matrices, so matrix rules apply here as well. Let's look at matrix product in NumPy using two different commands. When we operate on two arrays with different types, such as one is an int and the other is float, upcasting occurs, which means that the new result will be of the more general or precise type. In this case of floats and ints, the new type will be of float as you can see. NumPy also has some min and max functions implemented to be used as you can see. You can use the reshape method to control the rows and columns in your array as it shows. The operations we covered so far apply to the arrays as a whole, regardless of its shape, but we can specify an access parameter to apply them to that dimension specifically as you can see. The final concepts we will look at in this video are indexing, iterating, and slicing in array. For one-dimensional arrays, these operations can be performed just like performing them on a Python list. When the array is multidimensional, an index is specified for every axis. We provide those indices using a tuple separated by comma as you can see. When we don't provide an index for all the axes, the missing ones are considered as the whole slice as it shows. We can also use three dots to specify the remaining axis. So, both of these statements are equal. To iterate over every element in the array, where we want to extract every element separately, we can use nested loops to access the elements. Or we can use the flat function to arrange all the elements in the array directly, as you can see. In general, for multidimensional arrays, the iteration is done with the reference to the first dimension. That wraps it up for the basics of NumPy. You can visit it, you can visit its online documentation to learn more about functionalities and methods that this package has. We will meet in the next video to summarize our class and discuss our class project. Hello everyone. Well done on finishing this class. We started by differentiating between data science, data analytics, and machine learning. We then looked at what the recommender systems are and how they make it possible to find item suggestions for users in areas such as content streaming and online shopping. We then started to learn about NumPy and how to create and operate on array and matrix objects. To finalize our class, we will practice what we learned in a class project. The class project is as follows. When dealing with datasets, arrays, and matrices, we almost always need to find out more information about each array or dataset, such as the max, min, and sum of all columns. 
Now, NumPy does offer a direct way to calculate these things, but we want to see if we can implement how these functions actually work in an array. Create an array of 15 rows and 15 columns filled with random numbers between 0 and 50. Let's write a code to do the following. Find the maximum of every row and print it with its index without using the function max. Find the minimum of every row and print it with its index without using the function min. Find the sum of the diagonal elements in the array. Given a variable called number underscore x, assign the variable a random number between 0 and 50 at the start of the code. Then, without using the built-in functions, search the array if this number exists within it or not. If the number exists, print every index where the number occurs. I will see you in the next class. Welcome back everyone. We are approaching the end of this course and have started to learn and implement more and more advanced concepts in Python and uncover new concepts in the field of AI. In our class today, we will explore speech recognition and understand how such a concept became so popular around us today and look how speech recognition works. We will then continue learning about data processing packages by looking at Matplot and Python. Speech recognition can be defined as the machine or program's ability to identify spoken words or phrases and convert them to machine language. Basic speech recognition programs have a limited set of vocabulary within a certain language, but more advanced speech recognition algorithms with the aid of machine learning can recognize natural speech with different accents and ways of saying the same word or phrase. Speech recognition involves both the linguistic science and computer science fields. It works using language and acoustics modeling algorithms. The latter represents the relation between language units in speech and their audio signals, while language modeling matches word sequences with sounds to aid in distinguishing words that sound similar. The performance of speech recognition is commonly measured by calculating accuracy which can be calculated from the word error rate. There are a lot of factors that can affect the performance of speech recognition, such as accent, pitch, background noise, and volume. Now, for our activity in this class, we will look at how a simple machine learning model can be trained to recognize different words in a normal human settings, where background noise is considered. We are going to train our model on four different words, and on the background noise, and then we will test its accuracy by saying a set of words including all those four. We will do this exercise on Google's Teachable Machine, so let's get started. Welcome back everyone. In our class today, we will continue with data processing packages and will study the matplot for data visualization in Python. We have talked a lot about data and data sets, and a key part of dealing with data is to be able to clearly visualize key insights about it, such as plotting certain variables, looking at the distribution of our data, and many more. To help us with this visualization, we will use and explore the matplotlib. Matplotlib is a comprehensive library for creating static, animated, and interactive visualizations in Python. The matplotlib works with NumPy arrays best, when given other types of input, the matplotlib functionalities may not work properly. Hence, it's better to always convert our inputs to NumPy arrays. The library graphs data onto figures and gives users the flexibility to customize these figures and graphs to best highlight their data and purpose of those figures. This image shows you the different parts of a figure. There are two main ways to use matplotlib. The first is by explicitly creating these figures and access and calling methods on them, and this is referred to as the object-oriented style. 
or we can use the PyPlot API to automate the creation and management of those figures and use the PyPlot functions on the created figures. In this class, we will learn and focus on PyPlot as our method of choice. Let's start with a simple plot. First, we will import the matplotlib.pyplot library using the following command. Then, we will use the plot function to plot our array. The YLabel method will allow you to label your axis as you can see. Finally, to print your plot, use the method show. This demonstrates how fast it's to visualize an array or a list using PyPlot. You may notice that we only provided one list. PyPlot in this case assumes that these are the Y values of our plot and generates the necessary X values for them. And you can see that the X axis starts from zero as the X axis is simply the index for every Y value. And as Python NDC starts from zero, our X axis is initialized to start from zero as well. The plot function within PyPlot is very flexible and will take any number of lists or arrays. If we want to plot X versus Y, we simply provide both arrays and the plot is displayed as it shows. To design our line, we can simply add the design parameters to our plot function. This is a list of all available parameters that we can specify for every line within our plot. For example, to change the color of the line and its style, we use the following properties. What if we want more than one line in our plot? The fastest way to include multiple lines within our plot and directly provide our design preferences is as follows. We are going to start using the NumPy arrays as it's very easy to use and compatible with the matplot functions as we described earlier. The NumPy array signal contains the numbers from 0 to 5 with 0.2 step size using the arrange method as we saw earlier in the previous class. The first three parameters in the plot function correspond to the first line. For this line, we will draw a linear function where both x and y axis are equal to signal. The third input describes the properties of the line. R stands for red, and the two dashes describe the line style. Then the second three parameters correspond to the second line, where the characters BS stands for blue squares and the last three parameters correspond to the third line where those characters stand for green triangles. You can read more about the plot method using the following link. Now let's look at real life example of what we call time series data, which is data reading taken at steps of time such as electricity consumption, temperature readings, or even current readings taken from electrical machines. In this example, we are creating five dates using the date time module in the x-axis and we are pairing these dates with five random numbers between 0 to 100 in the y-axis. As you can see, the append method works differently in NumPy arrays. As the method appends the new data to the old data, then it should be assigned to a NumPy array. Let's look at the commands to give a title access labels and changing the size of our plot. In this example, we are creating a function that calculates the output of the following mathematical function and plot it. The exponential function calculates e to the power of x, where e is the Euler's number. The cosine function calculates cosine of a number x. The pi function will return the number pi.
PyPlot makes it very convenient to work with subplots. The subplot method takes three parameters. The first number refers to the number of rows for your subplots. The second number refers to the number of columns for your subplots. Both of these numbers act like coordinates of the subplots. The third number indicates the order of the subplots. In this example, we are plotting two functions with their respected orders as you can see. The text function can be used to add text in any location within the figure. The two numbers are the x and y coordinates for the text. We have covered the basics of plotting and we will delve deeper into PyPlot in the next video. See you there! Welcome back everyone. We will pick from where we left off with PyPlot. The last part we looked at in PyPlot was adding text. Let's now look at how we can annotate this text on the plot. By first adding our text, then the location of the point to be pointed at, followed by the location of the text, and finally the design characteristics of the arrow. This method draws an arrow from the end of the text coordinates to the pointer coordinates. You can read more about its other properties on the following link. PyPlot also makes it easy to deal with categorical plots. Let's demonstrate that through an example. The bar method draws bars on the plot where the first parameter includes the x coordinates of the bars and the second parameter includes the y or height value of the bars. The scatter method draws varying marker size of scatter plots. To know more about the other characteristics of the mentioned methods, you can visit the following links. The subtitle method shows one title for all subplots as you can see. Now we will learn how to create nonlinear axis. To specify the axis scale, we use the method y scale as you can see. In this example, we created a linear and log scale on the y-axis. To show the grid lines, we use the grid method as it shows. Finally, if we want to import data from a CSV file into a NumPy array and then be able to visualize it, we can use the GenFromText method. Let's take this CSV file as an example. This file contains data about heart failure clinical records for 299 patients. This dataset was taken from this website. Usually, the first row in any dataset or a CSV file is a list of column names. To import this file, we need to specify the file name, as you can see. Remember that NumPy array can only hold data from the same type. So, we should remove the first row of the CSV file as it's holding string data. We can do that using the parameter names equal true. The delimiter keyword is used to define how the splitting should take place. If you open this CSV file using Notepad, you will see that the elements are separated by comma. Remember that your file should be in the same directory of the notebook file. Once our data in a NumPy array we can easily visualize it with PyPlot. In the following example, we will write a code to visualize the death percentage versus age due to heart failure for all the patients in the dataset. You can pause the video and try to do it yourself.
we have used a couple of new commands. The unique method finds the unique elements of an array and assign them in a new NumPy array. We can also return the number of times each unique item appears in the array by assigning true to the parameter return underscore counts. The where method returns the indices of elements in the NumPy array where the given condition is satisfied. Finally, the sum method sum all the elements in the specified NumPy array. In this example, we will write a code to visualize the death percentage versus gender due to heart failure for all the patients in the dataset. You can pause the video and try to do it yourself. This covered the basics of how to use PyPlot within the matplotlib package. You can visit its online documentation to explore more detailed functionalities and learn more about the design and management of plots and figures. See you in the next video to summarize our class and talk about the class project. We are done with class 11. As always, we had started by discussing a new concept, which was speech recognition and we've developed our own voice classifier using Google's Teachable Machine. We then moved on and continued our work on Python data processing packages, talking about matplotlib. We covered the basics of how to visualize data and learn to utilize the PyPlot API to create plots and customize them in a direct and easy way. Now, we will practice this knowledge in our class project. In this project, we are aiming to write a code to output the following graphs exactly. Add a figure title and axis labels. That's all for our class. I will see you in the next topic. Welcome back everyone. Today we are covering the very interesting concept of graphical user interfaces. We will learn how to create simple GUIs in Python through the tkinter library. We will then use it to create an interesting application in our class project. But first, we will explore a new topic and start our class with an activity. Our new topic of this class is computer vision and image classification. We will learn what computer vision is and then look at how machine learning can be integrated with this concept. Computer vision is a major field of computer science. It's a concept that tries to mimic the human's perception system, from obtaining inputs from cameras up to processing and extracting knowledge from everything that the machine or computer sees. Today, and thanks to the massive scale of advancements in the fields of machine learning and deep learning, Computer vision has been massively improved, and it now superpasses human performance in many areas related to object detection, classification, and tracking. So, how does computer vision work? Taking inputs as images or videos is not a difficult task, but how to understand and extract insights from those inputs is the challenge. For example, in a self-driving car, the recorded video from the car's camera has to be processed almost in real time to detect objects, such as other cars, sidewalks, trees, and humans. It also needs to track some of those objects, such as cars in front, to be able to maintain speed and react in time for sudden stops or movements. There's a huge array of applications where computer vision is critical and very beneficial. Face recognition and detection algorithms are used extensively in social media to give you suggested photo enhancement or recognize people that you might have taken photos with. To make such algorithms work and perform well, they are trained using advanced machine learning and deep learning algorithms on millions of images and scenarios beforehand. The algorithms extract knowledge from those training examples and will be able to act on a new unseen data accordingly. 
For example, to allow a computer vision algorithm to recognize a truck from a car, it's trained on millions of examples of how trucks and cars look like. The algorithm extracts features from those images, such as the size of the object, the shape of the body, the size of the wheels. And then, when the algorithm is done with training, it's tested by showing it images of cars and trucks that it had not seen before and check if it's capable of classifying them correctly. This type of learning problem is a classification problem as we have studied before. Now let's train our own image classifier and use it as a fun game to practice this concept. Go to the following website. Now we will play a game of ping pong using image classification. Click the play button then select Allow to start using the webcam. From the preview window, we are going to take three different types of images. Let's say I will be using my hand to control the slider in the ping pong game. First, I will take 10 photo samples of my hand in the middle of the screen while making sure that the slider thumbnail position is in the middle also. Now, I will take another 10 photo samples of my hand at the top of the screen and move the slider all the way to the left. I will repeat the same process for the last 10 photos but changing my hand to the bottom of the screen and moving the slider to the right. After that, we will click Train. Once the training is complete, you can start playing the game using your hand. See you in the next video. Welcome back everyone. Let's start with the graphical user interfaces or GUIs. Up until now, we have designed codes that the user can only interact with through the command line. But as you know, the majority of computer programs and software that we deal with has some form of an interface where humans can easily interact with computers or machines. There's an entire field in computer science and computer engineering called Human Computer Interface or HCI that covers the details of how computer interfaces should be designed and structured to maximize efficiency and user experience quality. In this class, we will study the basics of how to implement a simple GUI for our codes in Python using the tkinter package, which is Python's default GUI package. The first thing we will do is to create a window using the following line. Creating a window in tkinter will instantiate an object of tkinter's tk class. You will know more about classes and objects in more advanced courses. Once our window is saved, we can set its title using the title function. Let's see how can we add objects to the window. We will start by adding a simple label to be displayed. We can change the background color using the BG parameter and the text or foreground color using the FG parameter. To manage the locations of the objects that we add, such as labels, buttons, and text boxes, we will use the grid function. Here are all the options that we can set for the grid function to specify the exact location of an object. In our example, we set the label to be displayed at column 0. The root.mainLoop is a function that continuously checks for events on our tkinter objects. This function blocks any code execution after it until our tkinter root object is terminated. Let's run our cell and observe the output. Now we will add some padding to make our label clearer. So far so good. We will now add a couple of buttons. 
the buttons won't have any functionality for now. We will program them to do something in a bit. Now with this code, this is the output that we get. The issue here is that our label is larger than our pink button, and both are in column 0 in this case, and the message button is in column 1. To fix this, we can make our label span two columns, and fix the size for our pink and message buttons. By adding the column span option to the label, and adjusting the padding on both buttons, we were able to make our interface much better. We also added the geometry function at the top to make the size of our initial window bigger for clarity. Then, we locked both width and height of our window using the resizable function and assign false to each of its parameters. We now know how to add labels and buttons and position them within our interface. The next thing that we want to add is a text box to take inputs from the user. For this, there are two types of objects we can use, one called entry and the other is text. They both allow for text entry, but entry only allows for a single line input, while text allows for multi-line entry. In this example, we will use the entry option. Perfect! Everything looks to be added correctly. We will now move on to the next video in the class to learn how to program those objects so we can interact with them. See you in the next video. Welcome back everyone. Let's pick up from where we left off with our interface. Let's start by learning how to program our buttons to do something. To program a button, we can assign a certain function to be executed whenever a button is pressed. We do that by specifying this function when we are creating the button object. We have added the code command equal play underscore sound to the line of creating the button underscore ping. This tells the code that whenever this button is pressed, go and execute the function play underscore sound. Now, we have to define this function to play a sound. In order for this function to work, we need to install the play sound package. From the Anaconda prompt, write pip install play sound. This will download and install the play sound package. Then, make sure to add the pink sound clip to the directory where the code is located. And by simply calling the function play sound in our defined function, we can make our button play a sound. Now let's program the message button to display text in a new label that we will create under those buttons with the message button pressed. To do this, we create a string var with the default value no button. String var command is used so that you can easily monitor changes to take inter variables if they occur. Now we will create a new function called display to change that variable to button press using the set function. This will happen when the user press the button message. In our label definition, instead of passing the text option, we pass it with the text variable and pass it with the string var that we created as you can see. Now, we will learn how can we pass a value when a certain button is pressed. 
We can do this using lambda functions. To practice this, we will add three more buttons and depending on what button we press, a different message will be displayed. What we have done here is link all the five buttons with one function called button underscore click. This function takes an input called button. This button is passed from the button we press. As you can see, the command now has a lambda function and what that allows us to do is to pass arguments to the function specified. In this case, we pass one, two, three, if the 1, 2, 3 buttons are pressed and we pass the string button pressed if the message button is pressed. We also pass 0 if the pink button is pressed. In our function, we take the appropriate action depending on what is the value of the button that's passed to the function. The final concept we will cover in this class is dealing with the entry object. We will study this by typing something in the entry box, then when we click enter, it should clear the window, then display what we entered in the console and in our green label. For this, we will start by creating the enter button and a function for this button that retrieves values from the entry box. What we have done is use the get function of the entry box to retrieve what was written in it. Then save the value in the variable user underscore input. Then we passed it to the green label using our string var. And finally print it in the console. We used the delete method to clear the text in the text box. Well done on all of your work this class. I will see you in the next video to summarize and look at our class project. Welcome back everyone, and well done on finishing the class. In this class, we started with the unique AI activity to train a computer program to classify images. Then, we played a ping pong game using our webcams. This was part of learning what computer vision is and how machine learning and deep learning have accelerated this field forward. We then moved into Python GUIs and learned how we can give our codes a friendly interface in a simple and easy way using the tkinter library. We learned how to create objects such as labels, buttons, and entry boxes. Then we studied how to program their functionality. We will now use the knowledge we gained to create two simple but very interesting apps. For our class project, we want to Create a small app that takes an input from the user and then gives the user three options, all capital letters, all small letters and invert as buttons. If the user chooses all capital letters, the app will take the input, then convert it all to caps, then display it in a label below the buttons. If the choice was all small letters, it would convert to small letters, and if invert was chosen, it would change all the caps to small letters and all the small letters to caps in the user input. We want to create a very simple for function calculator with plus, minus, multiply, divide, and equal buttons. 
Let's focus on the design aspect and the exercise as well and see who can create the most interesting calculator design. You can open the tkinter documentation online to check out many more functionalities and design options that you can apply to your app. Well done on all the hard work.